when you're having that nervous system arousal of the pain of life, of the stress of life, you are, yes, experiencing stress, but within that stress is an opening of neuroplasticity. That's part of the mechanism of cortisol in your system. When you are saturated with cortisol, you open neuroplasticity up. It helps you learn because that's part of the stress of pain and things like that. Oh, don't do that again. I'm going to create a new neural structure that tells me don't do that again. That's, that's the process. So if you can mindfully and consciously sit with your pain and allow it to pass through and say, I'm not going to react to this, but I simply am going to experience this, not as who I am as a person, but simply an experience that's moving through. And then while you come through, that only takes about 90 seconds to really pass through the painful moments. Once you come through to say, no, 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 this is who I am as a person. And to kind of rise up, have a little Phoenix moment, rise up in your nervous system, say, no, 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 I will not be that old person. I, I will be in a new space and sort of create a new little architect for yourself. There's a lot of mystics on the internet. Shout out and much love, you crazy fools um, that could use dusting off a textbook or two warmly without judgment and secondarily there are certainly a lot of scholars in academia who would be well served by eating a mushroom so i'm trying to bridge those two worlds i'm bob peck and this is karmic relief my background is in documentary film and comparative religion. I wrote a book called Original Sin is a Lie, How Spirituality Defies Dogma and Reveals Our True Self. It's an interview show where I talk to spiritual teachers, activists, scholars, people that live within these traditions and also appreciate the overlap. What happens when you start to get activated internally, that makes you activated in a compassionate way in the world. I'm thrilled to be talking to fantastic, inspiring human beings. Um, I have to do much less work, which is nice because I'm just asking them questions about their story. It's a life hack. Hi. I hope you'll enjoy these explorations, these really excavations um, in the ones I've filmed so far. They've all been really beautiful and deep and lighthearted. Um, so please enjoy Karmic Relief. I'm Bob Peck. I wrote Original Sin is a Lie. And now I'm asking a bunch of questions to intelligent, compassionate humans. I really love Daniel Tyak. He is a spiritual teacher, one-on-one -on -one mindfulness teacher, content creator, skateboarder, and emotional alchemist. He was a worship band guitarist for many years at mega churches. He had his deconstruction moment of questioning as a Christian, study in seminary, and we clearly resonate with our own mystical spiritual conclusions. Some people confuse him for me and vice versa. He's like a big bro or a big cousin. He's the SoCal skateboarder big cuz version of me. So check out Daniel's wisdom. Reach out to him if you'd like to have a session. He's a bright light. He's hilarious. Enjoy. Here we are. I mean, isn't that where we've always been? Where else could we be? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, in our head lost lost in some drama that doesn't even exist until we create it that's generally where we are i really want to get to your work and your story um but i thought it'd be funny if i just brought up the first time i ever saw your content i'm ready we're online buddies for about two years yeah dude we've been growing out year and a half we got a thing um mm -hmm. Because we make the same stuff. We basically tell people they're not dirty. Yeah. And we're not, we're, we also look like we're related. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> like my stash was like, you people, are... said, people have gotten us confused uh, when easy, you're on easy. my feed. <laughs> easy brothers. We'll just, I like that. I'm into it. Somebody said, you look like the AI version of me. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, that's which is so funny. really fucking funny. Um, Dude. Especially with, <laughs> especially with our conversation of the mascot thing, you know, of, yeah. of seeing our, you know, myself as a mascot, you know, it's like, I'm we not could really, easily, we could easily be cousins. Yeah, totally. Yeah. We could definitely hang at the same barbecue. That's for sure. Absolutely. The first video I saw of Daniel Tyak was on a skateboard with a bunch of people and probably your kids all around on skateboards and shit skating around you while you told the camera that basically we're not dirty and to enjoy your life. It wasn't quite a hedon hedonistic, but it was, you know, yeah, it, it was a very like healthy, like emotional reassuring thing. And it was like just sunny California, like all these like chill people skateboarding downhill <laughs> and it had like a billion people being like this is the coolest thing i've ever seen <laughs> i was like oh, i man. gotta know this guy <laughs> i love that yeah. i didn't know that was the uh i didn't know that was the first hit that was yeah. that's great yeah you did and, like a little series on the skateboards yeah i gotta get i gotta get back on the skateboard i've been uh mm -hmm. i've been like working too hard it's funny some of the some of the magic of the videos is to not care to have yeah. that like in the moment I'm on the skateboard and to run a business and to make everything work, you have to care. You have to like attach to an element of ego. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's funny. And the dynamic is the more I maybe try to care or maybe run my thing as a business and the less I skate, the worse the business does. It's an interesting mystical paradox, isn't it? Yeah, but we talked but, uh, too. We talked. We talked about like content planning versus diary. You know, it's like yeah. everybody doing this stuff is on the spectrum of content planning and dear diary, and like, you know, most of us are somewhere in the middle. Yeah, but I'm pretty dear diary, and yeah, perhaps and to a fault. That's the you know that's the thing. It's like then I see people doing the batch creation and fucking you know. But that's also but that's also very much your who you are as a person too even just like we're talking about human design you know being a reflector is very different than being a manifester mm -hmm. i constantly i have like this open channel to my voice like that is the idea of the manifester we're constantly mm -hmm. having like a new thing coming and so mm -hmm. yours is your content is so different than mine where yours is a reflective content you do great when it's a comment or somebody and you can reflect from that comment and yeah. you you match the energy too, not 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 totally completely, not especially not with like the hate filled ones, but it's like you come back with a little sass to a little sass, but you do it in this great like smooth bob way, you know. It's like this really Thanks, beautiful, brother. like it. You always match the energy, you reflect, you do really well in that thing. Where my manifestor side of human design is that open voice, where it's like, oh, here's a new idea, here's something creating something new you know so we're just you know different everyone does a different thing you know yeah there's all these different types of folks out here on planet earth you know i i was at a bar actually you'd like this i was at a bar and this gal was like do you know your human design i said yeah i'm a reflector and she goes mm -hmm. freaks out for a second i never met a reflector. It's, we're very we're very rare <laughs> very non -HD, really. hd crowd um daniel let's start can we start at worship band or do you want to start before that? <laughs> we can start there. I mean, it's not like a lot before that. I started that pretty early. Right. That's kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. Um, quick. If you want to go there, you want to go with like the, the religious history stuff? Well, yeah. So, you know, I'm Bob Peck. I'm the author of Original Sin is a Lie, How Spirituality Defies Dogma and Reveals Our True Self. And most of my friends on the making internet content from the heart in a sincere way um you know helping themselves in a way by being creative and helping other people by just contributing to the conversation most of you guys have overlap with me in that you're sharing authentic spirituality and many of you you're a great example um are are pretty hardcore ex Christian in that you were very involved. I wasn't involved. You know, some people are surprised because they think that I had this big dramatic, you know, exit or something. 
And that's not the case. I was just kind of always chilling on the sidelines, but. Yeah. I think um, that's why your, your work's so good. Cause it's like this really kind of open report. It's not like any bias mm, to it. Thank you. Yeah. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that I was able to just yeah. study, study it without the trauma. Yeah. You know? that so many people have and that you help people with, which we'll get to, but, but before we do that, yeah. Tell, tell me about like, I'll give, you know, you're I'll give a you guitarist, the, you're a musician. I'll, I'll give you, you like, the two, the, you. I'll give you like the too long. Don't read version. Right. It, I was just, I was, I, I was raised by a mom. She was just a church lady, mom, you know, just typical boomer church lady. We got taken to church. She loved it. It was like her social club. And um, so we just got raised in, thinking that it was it was a evangelical um you know thinking we're in judgment you know think of the original sin oh we're gonna go to hell if we don't do what we're told you know kind of thing like that and so you just get that really shitty (laughs) church conditioning baseline you know there it is and um, just typical family that's so resonant with so many people like that's very american of me to do and um i was I just was good at music and it just picked up music fast and there's just something about it. And um, I started playing in the, in the church band in like junior high, like right off the bat. So I was just always involved in music and um, that was just a big part of my life. And so it was almost like unthinkable to do anything other than what I was doing. Cause I was playing professionally in different churches and I just, everybody I knew was involved in it. And it's just the way the cult works, you know, everybody is like, oh, everybody stay in here. You know, don't, don't look out, don't look outside the doors. You know, it's like the village, you know, <laughs> it's a scary monster mm. in the woods, you know, don't go out there. Sure. And so I was just, it was like, I was almost just distracted by all the fun of it. I was having a good time, you know, I was playing in mega churches around San Diego and, you know, it was pretty cool. So, and um, ended up just having a really genuine exodus out of it but it took like 15 years it probably took like this 15 year ramp in and like this 15 year ramp out where i remember at one point i was like something's wrong here like something's crossed in the messaging like something's not right because i was sort of on stage like seeing it from a different perspective maybe and seeing all the leadership backstage and you know the it's just yeah you know seeing all the scandal shit and um i just something wasn't right and I remember I had said for years that, and I had gone to seminary and I had gone to some Bible college and done things like that and really studied. And I remember saying for years, I was like, yeah, I'm trying to forget everything I know so I can find out what's true. But that was kind of the thing I said. And I didn't realize how m- much I meant that, you know? And it was like, I was almost like spelling myself. Like, I'm really trying to forget what I know within this. So I, there's something I know is true, but it's something's off. And so I just was on this very natural deconstruction, I think, but I was still within the church and I was still playing prominently at these mega churches. And it was like a good gig, you know, it's you roll up backstage and you know, your gear's on stage and you know, you're paying, getting paid like a thousand bucks a month, you know, for you know, playing guitar for a few minutes. It's stupid. And um, so you just sort of get stuck in it, you know, you don't even realize it. You just think you're supposed to be doing it. And it wasn't until I had, my I, I really lucked out with life getting just totally hoodwinked on me, just getting everything destroyed. And um, I lost a business and my wife left and I lost kind of my social circles and I'm playing music and it's just all the things crumbled all at once. And it's like a year and a half. And um, I ended up in a space of, and even before that, I should back that up. I remember being in this kind of very devout, space in a way where i was like all right god like i really need to know the truth here (laughs) something is not right you know and that was like maybe a year of space before everything fell apart and it's funny looking back i was really looking for my ego to be deconstructed so i could be in that oneness that i was like i felt it there i just didn't know how to get to it and um, I had to have everything just destroyed. And it was like, I, people are like, what happened? And I was like, at, at first, the first few years of processing, I was like, I don't know what happened. Like, I don't, I don't know what the fuck happened in my life. It just exploded. And then later on, I was like, oh, yeah, I just like, I, I, I manifested it. The agony <laughs> like, in the garden, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I really want, I was asked, I really need to know what truth was. And it 
you got to lose, you got to, it's the eternal Tao that cannot be spoken. You know, you're going to got to lose all of your idea of everything to understand what is. Otherwise, well, you're just judging. I really like that you, thank you for sharing that. And, you know, it, there ha seems to be an arc like journey to, you know, in, in terms of kind of the hero's journey, the hero's ascent, you know, it's, it, there's, there's that dark period. And I really admire what you said about, when you went to seminary or you're going to Bible classes and things like that, like emptying, emptying everything. That's a, there's a Zen story of the student and the master uh, where the student is very eager to learn and the t this teacher won't teach him. And uh, he, there's a, a cup of tea and the master just sits there and pours all this, the tea and it's just spilling out of the cup. And they're like, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing, Master? He says, your mind is like this. I can't. Mm. You, you're too full. Of, yeah. You have to empty it first. And yeah. Um, so you didn't you didn't know that at, at the time. But that was a real sincere, uh, mystical yeah. wisdom uh, energy. Yeah, truly. Yeah. My, my mind was too full. And that's the funny thing. I, I have a lot of debates and, you know, things with Christians online and. And I look at, I think. Yeah, it's a, you do. I think <laughs> that's true. Yeah, I think I think of meditation because it's a practice of mine that's been really near and dear to my my journey. And I think of Jesus's example of very often being in the desert meditating, and there's a lot of these very oftentimes mentioned as meditating, and or out you know in the desert meditating and praying or something. And I remember being in church, and it's like, all right, you're gonna like meditate and pray. And I was like, all right, how do I do that? You know, and you'd like sit there and you're just basically like, okay, God, please, this and that. And you're like, you, you have no, con you can't, you couldn't meditate to save your life. You know, genie this is God. Like, yeah, yeah, genie God. Yeah, you're like rubbing the lamp continuously in your space of what should be meditation. And I look at all of Jesus's example of, of, of talking about, you know, being one with the Father and things like that. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you go off in the desert, you meditate enough, like you're, you're in that space of oneness. You, you don't have any need. You're, you're not going after if you're sitting in the fucking desert meditating you're not going after worldly needs you're, you're okay you found a space of peace in your moment you could be gandhi in the prison cell or you could be jesus in the desert you're perfectly at peace and you know it's like if you're at that oneness space and i look at that he's not on tiktok to, not on tiktok yeah he's and i just no, look at that not paying bills yeah that that whole thing of meditation in relation to christianity and i was like i don't think there's a single christian that could turn their mind off i think of my poor little church lady mom just all her like constant judgment and always just worrying about something and god's will and blah, blah, blah. and it's like just a den of trauma it's like the first thing a christian should do is learn how to meditate learn how to access that inner world that's just so spun on anyway i don't want to like yeah. that on that but no i i let's do it i, I mean what i was going to say is i think that american you know yoganandic calls it churchianity which is, mm, yeah. I mean, he was calling it that a hundred years ago. You know um, what's wild but, about that? I mean, I'm in Antonitas. Well, we, we, we gotta, we'll come back to you, Gananda. I just wanted but to say. I, I, the, the churchianity term, I had started calling it churchianity when I was in the church and I had no idea who Yogananda was. And I was like, what? Brother. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> anyway. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's all I mean. Well, and you, there's a lot of you have a different perspective of like people in his organization, which is a fascinating. But what I was going to say is the, the American churchianity crowd of evangelicals, just in my like granted outsider perspective, it's typically like Baptist. Um, but it's not, there's even some like non-denominational, which are not, you know, that, that was like the progressive thing there for a while. We're like, oh, well, yeah. we're non-denominational. It's like, oh, but they're just as judgmental as everybody else. Some of them. Yeah. It's um, just a different system of judgment. The, yeah. What I was going to say is, you know, in my study of the mystic traditions and really the saints uh, across different religious paths, um, the contemplative Christians are as good as it gets i mean and, and i'm someone who i lean hindu i lean buddhist the, the indian philosophers are, are really uh have spoken to me more than really any other uh tradition but you can't deny saint francis of assisi saint Teresa of avila uh i'm finishing women of power and grace and it talks about mother francis cabrini 
Mother uh, Maria Skatsova. These men and women were devout, sincere contemplatives that, and the early, early uh, the Desert Fathers were fat Saint Anthony the Great. That they, those guys went out in the desert because they were sick of it. Actually, the 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 very early guys, the the Orthodox yeah. and Irenaeus and the heretic hunters were ruling in the cities, and they were like making it this imperialistic thing. And these guys went out in the desert and fasted and, and tried to live like Jesus. So there's there's very good, you know, authentic Christian practices, but they tend to be unknown to a lot of like American Protestants. Yeah. You know, in my oh view. yeah, it's it's I mean I grew up in that American Protestant, like effectively it's just Wasp. like it's like people that got sick of all the Baptist bullshit that were like, we're just going to do it our way. It's like how Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic church was like, we're done with all your stuff. We're going to read it our way. And then they started, you know, that whole thing, the reformation, the, the non-denominational is like this, like it's reformation 2.0. It's like, we're You're done right. with all this, like we're liturgy, liturgist type stuff and Baptist type stuff. And we're, we want to just do it. Bring our, in the music. Our, our, like, Bring in Daniel. Work. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so it's just like a good rock show. Yeah, and um, all it's funny because the narrative is all about this like connection, and it's and Jesus and this. It's the narrative's all over the place. It's like psychotic if you actually think about it. You're like, what are we even talking about? You know, I don't know. What, I have no idea what you're even talking. What about. has this become? Well, it's, it's like so this whole far... language of <laughs> what, like, how in the has this have any relevance on life? So it's just I've seen it myself more from the old school like 90s churchianity like judgmentally stuff to like super judgy weird stuff to to the the you know 2000s you know contemporary kind of non-denominational stuff and then you have all of these you know the different sects of christianity that the lutherans and you have the baptists and you have the, the methodists and things like that these like older ones were all of the non-denominational ones are like oh those guys are that's not even that's not even real church we're really pursuing god here like they judge those guys and then right. all of them judge the catholics they're like oh the catholics are the devil they're the they're the devil and none of them realize that they're christians because the catholics wrote the religion of christianity yeah they don't even realize the roots of it they don't even realize that they're reading the manual that was put in places like political controlled, like 1.0. And they're just passing it down, like the, from generation to generation and, and judging this new way of judging. Oh, we're judged this way. We're judged that way. Here, let's introduce it's a new. It just becomes like multiplicity chaos, like multiplicity yeah. chaos of like, you know, I, I'm also doing a lot of research, which we don't have to go into deeply, because, but I will. It depends on how much coffee I drink. But um <laughs> I'm studying New Testament formation stuff like pretty hardcore right now because I'm working on a, a long form course about it. And um, dude, the first century, there is there are different groups. You these Bible scholars even say it's really Christianities in mm. the first century and second century because wow. it's and so that's just varied. The first century, yeah, and, and that's when it, it. But Christianity, the brand wasn't put in place till what three hundred eight with Constantine, right? Well, but that's like the that's like the brand the brand that the that the empire was like the hey, this empire. is what we're doing yeah. right that's when they go from being um you know the the persecuted martyrs of the state to being yeah. the state but that that said it was they were already a christian brand distinct from judaism by around really the turn of the of the uh, into a, into a hundred basically the, yeah the first to the second century is when um, I believe that was when Pliny the Elder, like we have we have letters from Pliny the Elder to Tr Emperor Trajan, who um, Christians are turned in to him in I think 112 or something like that. And mm -hmm. he writes the emperor and he says, you know, these guys aren't really breaking the law. They're very stubborn. They're very closed minded about doing the Roman civil duty that we all everyone else is doing. But these Christians yeah. have an issue with it, but they seem to have an ethical quality to them. Kind of, what do I do? And that's an yeah. early correspondence uh, that we have with kind of Roman records. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it, they there there was all these varieties. I mean, Paul, what Paul emphasized with was death and resurrection. What um, 
you know, the Gospels all have varying portrayals of Jesus. The Q source, which is Quella, which is a hypothetical document that we don't have, but that's 40% of Matthew and Luke have Greek verbatim uh, teachings, meaning that they were working with a source that's not Mark. And Q has zero information whatsoever on the death and resurrection. It's purely the ethical teachings. So Bible scholars mm -hmm. are just saying, no, there's all these different, and then you have the Gnostics, you have Thomas, um, you know, you, you have all these varying interpretations and different early church leaders that are debating over, was it his death? Was it his teaching? Was it both? Was it what aspect of his teaching? Was it, was it his Jewishness? Was it the new thing? Is he the Messiah? You know, like people have, they've literally human beings have been arguing about this man. Yeah. For a long time. Yeah. And, and they I, still I, are. I, the thing, the thing I find fascinating on all of that is just even the form formation of effectively what we perceive of as Christianity, where I, I look at even the formation and I'm like, all right, they killed Jesus. And then they had like 300 years before they really came out with like the brand of Christianity, where the Bible, like the first canon was canonized and mm. they had, they had, um, uh, when they were proclaiming it or Constantine proclaimed it. Christianity, the, the, the empire's religion is effectively around 300 years after Christ's death, right? Yeah, but the brand was there. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm saying like, but I'm, I'm saying, yes, the brand was there. Like, but you're saying some, from, from, from the victim of the state, because he's killed by the, he's killed by a Roman. Uh, what, what I'm saying, the time, the time when prosecutor, we had these, when Roman we had this, when we had these like different Christianities, the ones yeah. pre previous to when the church was like established. So in that time of those different Christianities, we also have the persecution of the saints, right? We have that's when Rome was killing Jesus, or at least the biblical narrative of that. And not Jesus, but his followers. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they I, go they go from being persecuted outcast to the state empire. Right. Right. Yeah. And so there's at least in the Christian narrative, there's all this talk of the the you know Rome persecuting the, the Christians and the yeah. martyrs and stuff. Here's what I find really intriguing in a lot of this is I was looking in Roman tabla and under the in ancient Roman law, it, about the time of Christ's followers being executed, and they were in at least the Christian narrative, they're um being uh crucified and thrown to beasts. And if you're in Roman Tabla, there's all sorts of crazy laws on magic and things like that. And it was effectively mm -hmm. the 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 crucifixion and being thrown to beasts was a punishment reserved for witches and wizards, basically. So I look at yeah. that and I was like, oh, I was like, yeah. what? I was like, Rome is executing Jesus's followers under laws of like witchcraft. Correct. You know, so I'm like, oh, they're just a bunch of like energy workers and 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 witches out there. And then of course we have all that like suppression of those practices through all of those areas of you know any kind of gnostic or mystical practices that can only be issued by the church in that time you know it's like they kind of suppressed all of the other religions they suppressed all of the other uh followings the gnostics you know where's their stuff we don't even have well, it the, anymore, you know one of the issues um with that the romans had with early christianity was that it was new uh, ancient Judaism, or Judaism was ancient, and the Jews had worked out essentially an agreement with the Roman administrative, uh, you know, ruling class, the emperor, and so on, that they were able to practice their holy days. They they didn't have to sacrifice to the gods and to the emperor because they were an ancient religion. They were kind of they had grandfathered. Their, they, had their, they were grandfathered in exactly, mm -hmm. and but the Christians. Were this new thing they're, they're this novelty and yeah. and they they say that you know they the they, pontius pilate killed him you know a, a roman governor killed him so essentially it's not a religion religions are ancient it's a superstition it's this new thing that's a superstition so you know in that turn really it's it's in the second century when they start to break away from the jews um because in the in the first century, there's all Jesus following Jews. The, the time the gospel writers are all Jews, essentially. But by the by the time you're into you know 150, um, the diary prison diary of Perpetua is in 202, uh, she's, who was one of the first martyrs, who was a pregnant young girl, and 
um, you know, then it's a full blown thing. But yeah, it's really fascinating. I mean, I think Daniel, the reason I'm so interested in all of it is because, you know, one, it's so relevant to, uh, and particularly America, but really the world in terms of the influence of this tradition on society and um, culture and so on. And just so many Christians, there's so many Christians in the world. Um, and secondarily, that, you know, all this stuff, like when you really read into it, and really what I tried to do in, in, in my book and kind of in my future work is really show the humanness to the development of all this stuff mm. because christians think most christians think generalizing here but most christians think that this thing is divine if it's not infallibly divine then it's at least divinely inspired you know yeah mm -hmm. i've heard all those and you know that that might be true in some ways in terms of jesus being an awakened man you know i do as you and i both talk about our admiration for him but the actual putting the documents together and the, the, the developments mm -hmm. are so political they're so human um they're you know they're, they're or, even manipulative and machiavellian in some cases it, even like before even or maybe after all that you know, where just the point where like evangelical Christianity lives, where they take, they hold up a Bible and they have an argument over, should it be King James, new King James, new international version. They're, they're, yeah. they're like, they're, they're having arguments that forego like different canonizations. Like how many books are in this Bible? You know what I mean? Like what's actually included. It's like, they're arguing so far after the fact of all of these other very human changes and interactions and they arrive at oh this is a sacred holy word of god that literally was birthed out of the womb of the world and delivered right. you know it's like this the sacrament that it's, it's it's holy you know and it's like you have no idea it's just people and the same the same christians in modern christianity that are so filled with shame and judgment which came from you know augustine's tradition you know great book bob I have it right here by the way we were just oh, talking about we were just thanks, talking brother. about it on, on I, I literally pulled it out because we were talking about it on live right before I jumped on with you. That's so funny. But that's, Thank it's you. like, we, we can see that as this tradition of the Catholic father that just became a, a, a doctrine. Yeah. And then ain't the modern Christians have this view that Christianity existed previously to Catholicism, that the Bible was birthed out of the womb of the world or something like that. They have no concept of that it was formed by people and it was formed by the same Catholic church that they all hate, yet they say this is the holy word of God. It's the weirdest thing to me. They have no, there's like no comprehension of the historical, very human timeline of, of fabrication. And, and and even just just reading the damn thing, you know, I mean the 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 Jesus of Mark wouldn't recognize the Jesus of John. The the actual the main character of each of the four gospels behaves so differently. Um, in different, yeah. in, in you know, it, it, what happens is everyone kind of reads a verse here and a verse there and a verse here and a verse there, and it's just like, oh, it's yeah, all the not, same thing. It's mm -hmm. all the same guy. But when you really put it together in terms of like characteristics of, yeah, um, if you actually look at it, I've it's I've, overwhelming. When I was when I was in Christianity, just in my own experience, it's like I read through them many times. I've read through the Bible multiple times, like cover to cover. Like I'll be like, I'm going to do it in a year, you know. And uh, yeah, I I would do that. What are you reading right now, Daniel? The Bible again. The Bible again, right? I'm studying the Bible. It's the Holy Word of God. You know, it's you know, it's, everybody just takes it for whatever they read it as, but whatever. And um, no, like, I admire I read, young I, Daniel reading the Bible, trying I to figure from, it the hell out. I was going. Did I had like I was I was studying. Did I have my like concordances out? And I was doing all sorts of stuff. I was trying to figure things out. <laughs> Always. <laughs> anyway, it's like. I even in reading it so many times and studying it, I never realized, I never could see that differentiation between, oh, this is like a different story. It was like each time you read it, you read it through the lens of God and Jesus, God and Jesus, or something like that. You just don't yeah. even think. You just sort yeah. of. Yeah. It, ta it takes some mapping out. You know, th there's a really good example in this PBS doc that I'm obsessed with called From Jesus to Christ. Hmm. Um, which cool. is really good it's from 1997 which makes me like it even more because it's like it's very like just late 90s slow 
like but Lo-fi. decent production it's, value it's, hey, but it's, it's like still cool like now. it's like yeah retro, it's cool it's retro it's cool like, <laughs> it's like papyrus font like it's aw- it's awesome <laughs> and uh oh yes one of the scholars, uh, John Dominic Crossan, mentions the agony in the garden. And he says, um, "It's we call it the agony in the garden, even though there's no agony in John and there's no garden in Mark. But we call <laughs> it this because we put them together. Basically, in Mark, this is before he gets arrested. In Mark, Jesus is prostrated on the ground, begging God to make this pass. But, you know, he'll do what God wants and the disciples all flee. Mark basically Mark is writing to a very persecuted community in the immediate aftermath of the temple's destruction. The temple in Jerusalem yep, yep. is destroyed in 70 and it's a chaos. Um in John, which is anywhere from 100 to 120, different community entirely, Jesus is not on the ground. All the Jerusalem forces come out, all the hundreds of troops come out to capture Jesus, and they end up on the ground. Yep. And Jesus says, of course, I will do what the father wants and tells them to let his disciples go, go, you know, in Mark, Jesus is out of control. And John, he's totally in control. Both gospels in the Bible, you know, and then, you know, what essentially what the scholar says, neither of them are historical. They're both portraits by these different authors for different communities at different times. And, yeah. But we've just mushed them all together, and this is the and Holy what's, Bible. What's intriguing is both of those could be true from a different perspective at the same time. It could be that Jesus was out of con- like in this deep pain in his inner world, and and processing it and holding it. And in his outer world, he was in in control and knocking people over with God's spirit. It could both be fucking true. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? It's like that could be a, a picture. It's just can be an analogy of that particular author's point of view of what was happening. And everybody takes it as literal or not. It's like we have no idea. Yeah, it's basically to me what it means is that they're just it, it's not journalism. Yeah, you know? exactly. It's like, that's, that's, it's like you're, it's just a, a story to pick up a vibe if you like it. That's about it. Yeah, and besides, you know, we got some tra- gems. We got some gems from the guy. That's what matters. But the actual, exactly, like, four, it's like, the four witnesses thing. Take the gems and run. But the rest of it, the rest of it, if we're actually following the tradition, is all on faith, believing in things you cannot see. Right. Like that's it. That's it. That's the whole like the crux of it. And everybody tries to say, "Oh, well, the Bible's true. We're proving it true." And it's like, no, no, no. What happened to the faith part? Why do you got to prove it true here on this plane if your home is in heaven and it's the faith thing? It's like it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And I I appreciate your swashbuckler energy about it all because you can you can see the value in it. You know, I, that's why we're friends is because you can see the value in it. And also, like, it, you have zero hesitation in calling out people that are blind and dogmatic and you know foolish and stubborn about it Uh, because they find your stuff you know and they find my stuff and we have we have had angry christians comment on our material and you you're almost you have some envy about the amount of angry christians i have it's like i I shut them down too fast I'm too like <laughs> brutal about it, Bob. Like you get, you keep it going, you know. And you get good stats out of it. <laughs> I had a guy for like a few months who oh, would, like comment on a bunch of stuff, and then finally we started messaging. Yeah. And he he was he was trying to say that like Orthodox Christianity. I don't know if you've seen that, but like there's this idea that like Eastern Orthodox Christianity, which is like kind of like a third thing, you know. You talk yeah. about Protestantism, yeah, it's a totally and different Catholicism. Thing. Oh, that's yeah, the, Eastern that's Orthodox. The, Dude, if you look at the original, like that's so witchy. Like the original, like yeah, old school guys, like it's all Egyptian. black robes, and it's like witchy, witchy shit. I love it. <laughs> it's Egyptian, dude, for sure. Yeah. And also at the same, here's the other thing though. Irenaeus, Bishop Irenaeus, is the ancient persecutor of the of the Gnostics. He's the guy who wrote against heresies. And the Gnostics are pretty rad. But, you know, I've been called yeah. a Gnostic. Uh, that, they were like online. the. the they're like the mystical witches and these other guys on the you know the the church that took right all the, took and all so the but so Irenaeus founded the Orthodox Church. Orthodoxy in Greek means straight thinking, like orthodontist, 
yeah. being straight teeth. Yeah. So he was saying, no, all these, um, you know, these heretics are in making their own interpretations were the straight, you know. So anyway, yeah. that just adds complication to any kind of like appreciation for modern Orthodox Christianity. But um, but anyway, this guy was like following me in the comments and, and messages for a few months. And he was like, will you debate this Christian scholar and all, like all this little stuff? And like. I have nothing to prove. Why would I debate <laughs> anybody? Like, I don't care. If, if whoever's into what I'm doing, great. Yeah. You're going to come feel, after me. It's just the mascot, baby. There's part of me, and, and especially in doing healing work and things like that, and, and helping people out, of, you know, doing session work with people, working people yeah. out of different spaces of being stuck. It's like, I like to put myself out there to the point where the people that are coming out of it, as I was, that were looking for some truth, go like, oh, this guy can answer my questions. You know what I mean? So it's like, I sort of like to get out there and poke the bear a little bit and sort of push the envelope intentionally to let people know, hey, I'm you're safe to talk to me about this. You know, if you're feeling that way, and then the rest of the guys get mad at me and that's okay. That's just good for the stats. Yeah. <laughs> well, and thank you for bringing that up because let's talk about it for a little bit. Your your one-on-one -on -one work is a, uh powerful you know kind of counseling modality which you call emotional alchemy and a lot of it in my view just context for the audience here you are doing essentially presence extreme presence with another person and from my understanding and you and i only know this because you do it in our calls and we you know in our group calls and so on and people it's tangible um, yeah, yeah. So tell us what it is and kind of how you guys started doing it. That the tangible presence thing you feel, that's just my own little magic that I do with people when we're on calls. You know, that's that's why people come and do a one-on-one -on -one session. Um emotional alchemy is a modality that it, it's it's so intriguing to me, Bob, because I swear if this thing came to me and and like I was on a mushroom trip and I was sitting there meditating. And all of a sudden, it was like a light dose, not super heavy. I was just sort of meditating one night and deep in there. And all of a sudden, I was like working on my inner world. I could feel stuff. I knew something was going on inside. I was like, I could feel these emotions. Like, what is this? And I was just like deeply in this space of like extreme presence with myself. What am I actually feeling? Like, what's going on in my inner world? Hmm. And I had this, I, I, it wasn't a vision. It was just like, it was like Neo in the Matrix. Like, I know Kung Fu. It was like, and I'm like, this is, oh, that's what that is. It was like, that's mm -hmm. what I'm doing. I understand. And it, it was, I started working through this process of identifying these somatic feelings and sort of unpacking them and learning how to work like down into my trauma in a way, into these like repressive memory spaces. And it was another time and it was, it was a really neat, confirmation it was like a time i was just meditating not on any mushrooms and i had sort of like this maybe the second half of it came to me i don't know i don't know how to explain it that way but then the feeling of how like the knowing of how to work through this these emotional spaces these these maybe what we would call like the, the shadow or your wounded inner child or just some old bullshit memories and nervous system conditioning and we we because we carry trauma in our physical body and you know Very that's much something so. that uh mm -hmm. you, what is it your body the body keeps the score body keeps um, the score yeah bessel van der kolk bessel van der kolk yeah like that's that's essentially what you, that's been a revolution in yeah. mental health and kind of seeing the association with physical health because what yeah. is it it's like the deer that like shakes off the mm -hmm. yep. you know, yeah yeah it's like that? an energetic thing oh yeah big time and you could do that with you do that with skating too when you take a big hit off something you don't you know mm. not lay there you got to get back up and run otherwise mm. like the trauma kicks in and it's like that's how skaters like self-regulate and i've been doing that for years it's just a, you learn practice like do not stop and stay in your pain like you got to like stomp your feet and run and it's like this energetic shake off from uh, effectively what's happening that's is that's I've, had a, I've had a bunch of crashes man and it's it's what happens is it's all an energy exchange 
when your body, physical body, hits the ground, there's a kinetic exchange and it spins up all. That is how heat is measured. That's how energy is measured. It's the kinetic energy spins up your atomic structure. That's exactly what all that inflammation is. It's all that energy that it effectively spins up the atomic structure of each atom and you end up swelling from the atomic level from a kinetic exchange. You can totally shake a lot of that off with a foot, good foot stomp or two and a little bit of like <laughs> grounding, a grounding meditation. It's a, the most intriguing thing. If you have a good practice of like shaking that energy off, just like a dog or a deer shakes it all off. If you stop when you get a hit and you go out, it like locks up more and you will, you'll be more swollen. You'll be more inflamed. It's, it's the most interesting thing. So anyway, and that's just some, a, and, that's well, just and some of what you do, but it's relevant because some of what you do yeah. with your, with your one-on-one clients is you're, you're helping them to notice their where, own box. Yeah. Where it this. is and what we're, the cause is. We're utilizing the, the body. We're utilizing feelings to identify are hidden blockages some old pain that's been pushed into the subconscious and so if you consider the the first time you were burned by some fire you don't really remember it you know unless your parents told you some stories about the first time you were burned you, you only remember that much but you don't remember the first time you were burned but you still have this very real reaction to heat after that oh i know exactly what that is i'm going to immediately pull away if i smell it i'm going to trigger um you know like you, you know what heat is and you've never thought mm -hmm. about it you just immediately respond to it. And it's the same. And like you smell a little bit of smoke. What do you do? What does your body do? Instinctual. And what is that? It's yeah. like this instinctual burst of anxiety. Because it's 100,000 years of uh, exactly. village burning, and, right? I mean, yeah. yeah, exactly. It's, just, it's like you know. And that's the same thing that happens with our traumas, with all of the stuff. So when you're in a contextual trauma of your family growing up and your nervous system gets regulated that way, it feels super normal to you. It feels completely normal. And people say, well, I don't know why I'm acting this way. Because up here, everything's fine. And what we don't realize is we're so disconnected from how we actually feel because we just work on this little dinky process up here, which is literally 10% or less of your experience. If you look at your brain waves, you got your alpha, beta, your gamma, delta, and your theta brain waves. That's all of your activity of you. That's me moving my hands around, the neural reception moving my mouth and having me breathe in my parasympathetic while my sympathetic act reacts to you and stuff like that. But there's 100% brain waves. We have access to like 10% of that alpha brain waves. And above that is or half of that is our trigger space anyway. And when we're triggered, we lose areas of the left hemisphere of the brain that go, our executive function goes offline. We become dumb, an, dumb animals that are just reacting to life through our unconscious bias. So like we don't even exist at that point. So we really only have conscious access of life for about 5% of this bandwidth of brain waves. The rest of our experience is subconscious. It's all of the, the, the aversions to heat and this person scaring me and I should be afraid and all of this stuff that just rides in our nervous system and we react to everything in life around us. And so that is the, that is that the anxiety that people feel, that looming dread, uh, everything. It's just you, you responding to life around you. You haven't learned that you're safe. You haven't learned that you're in a moment. And so what we do in emotional alchemy sessions is we just – sit down and we learn how to have a good moment instead of being afraid. We address those fears in the midst of safety and we learn how to turn those things off. And there's a really cool, the, the alchemical process of it, even though it's not, you know, alchemy or anything like that. It's just a very transmutive process. It's a very real thing in the nervous system. And you guys can, this is exactly how it's done. Feel free to practice at home. Everybody take this and teach your friends and your family. When you are feeling the discomfort of life, pain, the, the uh of life, the anxieties of it. That is nothing but a feeling that you are experiencing. It's a reaction to something in your field. Why are you reacting? Because you learned in your past that something was unsafe and it's in your subconscious and you're just instinctually reacting. When you're having that nervous system arousal of the pain of life, of the stress of life, you are, yes, experiencing stress, but Within that stress is an opening of neuroplasticity. That's part of the mechanism of cortisol in your system. When you are saturated with cortisol, you open neuroplasticity up. It helps you learn because that's part of the stress of pain and things like that. Oh, don't do that again. I'm going to create a new neural structure that tells me don't do that again. That's, that's the process. 
So if, if you can mindfully and consciously sit with your pain and allow it to pass through and say, I'm not going to react to this, but I simply am going to experience this, not as who I am as a person, but simply an experience that's moving through. And then while you come through, that only takes about 90 seconds to really pass through the painful moments. Once you come through to say, no, 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 this is who I am as a person. And to kind of rise up, have a little Phoenix moment, rise up in your nervous system, say, no, 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 I will not be that old person I, I will be in a new space and sort of create a new little architect for yourself and if you can stretch mm. into it every time if you can sit with your pain every time it will recondition your nervous system systematically to no longer fire in patterns of fear and so you can then create a new space of feeling because the whole damn thing is feelings all of the thoughts we're having they're based on that 90% feeling arena, how we're reacting to life. And then we think about it. The sympathetic, para, the sympathetic nervous system fires before your thoughts. You make all of your judgments based on how it feels to be you before you can even consciously process them. So if we are just allowing ourselves to react to life, we will never learn. And when we allow ourselves to back it up and to sit with our pain and to practice all the things Jesus was talking about, of forgiveness and being here with people, you know, just not, not judging people, not judging it as dangerous, but to realize that it is a big, dumb illusion. I and think here you're I like, am in this moment, you know? That's so beautifully put, and I'm almost regretting uh cutting you off there um you you remind me of like a psychedelic Thich Han, kind of a, like a little bit like i mean you describe <laughs> things like of absolute wizard which is like part of your charm is that when you just get in the zone you could just spray these cellular formulas and it's really I, I do hypnotizing a, i do have a wand too so. You have a wand, and yeah, uh, I use it to forgive people. I let them know you were forgiven, and uh, it's just yeah, it's mesmerizing, and and it and it also it makes sense. It's not like you're just babbling. What you're saying to me, what you're getting across, is that that ninety really, it's like the ninety first second, right? It's like because it's about ninety sixty to ninety seconds. Yeah, for is a big that feeling, tense for yeah. a big one. You yeah. know, and, and that's like, like oh, can, I need a you smoke. Can... Oh, I need a dr hit of the drug. I need, you know, yep. a sex addict. I got to go yep. gamble. Like all the fucking patchwork of and the being, fear and the subconscious. Learning to stop your reaction. It goes away. Sit with that for 90 seconds is the difference between anxiety and a panic attack. Hmm. If you can stop the, okay, hold on. I'm just having an experience of anxiety. I'm going to just allow myself to experience this instead of it becoming me when it becomes you then it ramps up into the next level and that's when you get into you know that's why i say it's the difference between anxiety and a panic attack when we allow when we learn to to master that inner world through through reaction or through response instead of reaction we we learn to master our experience because as within so without you know it doesn't exist out there if it exists, if it doesn't exist in here, if there's no peace here, it's, there's no peace there. If there's, if there's calm within your heart, if there's, there's oneness, like what Christ is talking about, this I am state, you know, you realize the elusive nature of where you're at, that you're in a much bigger picture. You know, this world is not your home. You are then with it all. You know, it's this, this backwards thing. Maybe it's acknowledgement. It's like forgiving yourself. It's, it's becoming one with the moment, you know? Uh, I'm having this, yeah, this radical experience. acceptance. Yeah, it's ra it's radical acceptance, and it's a, the practice you can to alchemize your own emotions into a space of peace. It's just a lot of forgiving yourself, you know. Oh. It's a lot of working with your own trauma to working with your own triggers. Just not say, "Oh, you triggered me," but hey, thank you for this gift of showing me a space of my own dysregulation. Let me find out why I am scared, and I'm not going to put that on you. I'm not going to continue my own pain. It's like this radical acceptance of self. It's a radical emotional responsibility. And it's all through the vehicle of forgiveness. Like you can't do it without forgiving yourself. You have to, if you want to forgive others, you got to forgive yourself. That's the whole game. You're also kind of reminding me of this is saying and not a biography of a yogi. Apparently it's a reference to the Vedas, but I had trouble finding the source. But anyway, Sri Teshwar says uh, the definition of a man of God or a person of God is soft as a flower as kindness is concerned strong as thunder when principles are at stake 
Mm. Mm. That's kind of what you're, that's what you're giving to me. It's like, there's this mm. lightness and this joy. And at the same time, this like strength and discipline and, you know, yeah. capacity to like withstand, really, that's what it sounds like too. It's like this capacity oh. to withstand the, the, to you hold, know, the waves, to hold that space. To hold, to be in oneness is to hold the darkness with the light. Mm -hmm. And you got to have some fucking grit to hold the darkness. Mm 